Welcome to the RPDS Online Learning Community's Advanced Art Book Club. Uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, the R4DS Online Learning Community is a free and open community of R learners helping each other learn more about using R. Uh, we offer free R help on our Slack at r4ds.io slash join, and we also host a number of book clubs like this one. Uh, we're delighted to host Hadley Wickham today for a Q&A. Hadley's chief scientist at our studio, uh, soon to be POSIT, he created the packages known as the Tidyverse and wrote or co-wrote uh, four related books so far, four R related books. Um, R for Data Science with Garrett Grohlmund and for the upcoming second edition, uh, Mine Chetankaya Rundell. Uh, that book inspired the creation of this community. He wrote ggplot2, Elegant Graphics for Data Analysis, which is being updated to a third edition right now with Danielle Navarro and Thomas Lynn Peterson. Uh, he has R packages with a second edition that's currently in progress with Jenny Bryan. And this club, Advanced R, which had a second edition a few years ago now. Uh, today, we're going to focus primarily on Advanced R, but feel free to also ask questions about Hadley's other books or other R related topics, and we'll get to those if there's time. Uh, the link to ask questions is in the chat, and I'll repost that occasionally for anyone who joins later. So without further ado, welcome. <laughs> All right. Thanks. So um, this is taking place right after the this cohort finished the object-oriented programming section of the book. And so uh, the goal is to start there. Um, I put in the chat your uh, talk from our studio comp this summer about R7 because uh, that's not in the book. That's the new object-oriented system. And I just want that to be uh, available so that everyone can be aware of that. Because I think we have some questions in here that relate to that. So um, I guess we can go ahead and get started. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So uh, about R7. So R7 being the new uh, successor to S3 and S4 that is currently in progress. Um, there's a question for all of the S3 that's in the tidyverse. Will the goal be to update the, all of that to R7 or just like as it comes up? I, I think at some point we will like commit to switching it to uh, <laughs> wholesale, but there will be like some point in the probably fairly distant future because we we'll want to do kind of small experiments just to make sure that R7 uh, can do everything we need, but because you know R seven is perfectly backward compatible with S three, there's no reason for us to not do that. And I think that's the that's the goal. <laughs> just it does take a while to you know. One of the things I'll have to figure out is if R seven goes into base R or features needed to make a work go into base R. How do we figure? How do we work that in the tidyverse when we need to support versions like the last four versions of R. So we've got some little challenges we will need to face along the way, but I'm confident we can figure that out. That makes sense. Um, so we had a question. Uh, I'm sorry, I archived that one. I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure who asked that one, uh, but June asked, uh, th there are a handful of functions in the tidyverse that are written as generics with only data frame for the methods. Um, I know mutate is like that. I'm not sure what else. Uh, what's the mo motivation behind that design? What are some pros and cons around that? I mean, I think like the dplyr examples are, are really uh, good examples because the the fact that that generic allows packages like dbplyr and dtplyr to work because you can now you know tra translate the the expressions that you write into other systems, whether that's SQL or data table or something else. So I think that that's the big advantage of kind of making things generic is that other people can come along and implement the same method um, for other, other types of object or other approaches. The, the big cost of making them generic is that then you know, it becomes much, much harder to um, make changes to the original function. And so sometimes, we leave functions like just as regular functions for quite a long time until we're pretty confident that they're correct. 
so like things like pivot longer and pivot wider, um, I think are not generics. <laughs> Not sure. Um, well, there's there's functions in tidy out that are not generics yet, just because we're sort of incubating them and want to be pretty standard and then we've got the right interface before we open them up for other people to extend. That makes sense. Um, so uh, I mentioned that the second edition of Advanced R came out, I think it was three years ago now. Uh, do you have any plans for a third edition? Mm, not currently. There will be one eventually i'm sure i think the main the, the, yeah i guess advanced are uh, missing something on r7 <laughs> and then i think the way we think about kind of tidy evaluation has evolved quite a bit since the book was written so everything in the book is like still correct and true but we've mostly come up with ways to avoid having to learn all of that theory in the vast majority of cases so right. um, that would be nice to update at some point too uh and yeah specifically um i mean I, you probably don't know exactly would r7 be a separate chapter do you think or largely yeah in place? i guess it could be like another chapter <laughs> an object <laughs> system um, I mean, probably, I think it would probably become like the first chapter and then S3 and S4 would get much um, shorter. Uh, right. I'm not like, I don't know, like, the, <laughs> like I, I love all of my method dispatch diagrams for S4 with emojis, <laughs> um, but I'm not sure like how useful that actually is. I think it mostly convinces you that multiple dispatch plus multiple inheritance is really complicated um and that you shouldn't use it and the once that's written that you know that probably doesn't deserving of that much space in, in the book <laughs> well on that note uh federica who um like led this cohort and uh set this all up uh she asks what are the criteria um basically i, I know like Everything I can think of that you write is uh, S3. Do you ever use the other object-oriented systems? And if so, when? Uh, like almost never use <laughs> S4. Um, the one place we do use it is in Lubridate because we needed the, the double dispatch in order to do things correctly for date times. And so I think like Lubridate is likely to be one of the places where we try out R7 first, because that would allow us to eliminate that S4 code, which is a little trickier for folks to understand and to maintain. Um, we use R6 a few places, um, mostly internally, like when we do need some kind of mutable object to um, track state over time, but I just don't, of love it as a, exposing that to the user so generally that gets it's like somewhere in the in the depths of the of the package um i think that the scales i think the scales package might use it because yeah because like the scales package has to like take every layer and every facet panel and ggplot2 and kind of accumulate all of the ranges for all of the, the aesthetics and so doing that with like without having some object that gets modified like you have to you have to pass some object like all the way down deep into this function and then take all the results all the way back up again and so like the scales like having immutable object just makes that so much easier but from the outside like you you don't know about that you, you're never forced to confront that makes sense um i guess to throw in technically ggplot has its own system right yes <laughs> so, so ggplot2 also has uh object oriented system embedded inside of it called ggproto um which only exists for basically bad reasons i think <laughs> 
but it's like too hard to it's too hard to get rid of it at this point. So if you want to extend ggplot to, you've got to learn a little bit about G, ggproto. Fortunately, it's like very very similar to, to R6, so there's not too much to learn. But just like we we when we at various points we've considered like rewriting it to use R6 instead, but it's just just doesn't seem to be worth it. That makes sense. Um. So the next question is, um, are there any uh, like styles or roles of R users that you wish knew more about object-oriented programming? And um, are there any that you just think really, really should learn more about object-oriented programming? So just kind of, you know, one uh, aspirational and one, no, seriously, this is when you need it. I don't know. I, I've always had a problem like trying to put into words why object oriented programming is so useful. Uh, and it's not like 100% clear to me that it's like that useful during data analysis. Like, so I think it, it's definitely something that as you kind of transition from being someone who uses R, like primarily for data analysis to doing like more programming and software engineering, then it starts to become more important because it's just an important tool in your toolbox for like making code do different things in different situations and like you know isolating things so that separate concerns are not mingled together and just making it easier to to maintain over time um but it's hard for me to say like when you should you when you should use it like i can like i'm you know look at packages and like, oh, they sh you should have used it then, um, or it would be much easier. But it's, it's, I, yeah, it's one of the things I still kind of struggle with is how to like say, like when you should be thinking about it. Fair. So on that, oh. I'll, um, once I'm done with all the books I'm currently working on, uh, the next book I want to work on is this Tidyverse design guide. Um, the title might change, but the idea is to start really start getting into those issues. Like when, like what sort of problems, like when you see this pattern, like this is a good opportunity for you to use object owner program. Or like when you do this, like you should be thinking about these three things. Or this sort of problem, here are the three approaches you might take and the various pros and cons. And um, so hopefully like over the, like maybe that's gonna be, that book's gonna be probably two or three years of writing, but um, once they will hopefully have some more, like at least case studies and examples of like why why use OO programming instead of something else. That makes sense. And that uh, tees up a question really well that um, you know, I heard you're working on that next. Uh, before then, would it be useful to you to get uh, comments on what's there now? Or is it so far from done that it wouldn't be very helpful yet because a lot of us like, are interested in reading it so <laughs> like so far from done i think it's not that <laughs> useful um i mean some of the chapters are kind of some of them are, you can just see it's like basically me dumping random sentences that's not understandable by anyone else and some of them are a little more fleshed out um but i think generally it's just too like you'd just be telling me things like i already know and just haven't had the time to do it basically that is totally fair. All right. I think that's all the object-oriented questions that we have right now. So diving into some more um, advanced R topics. Uh, is there a chapter in advanced R um, that you wish you could have added, but you didn't, like it, it wasn't quite there. There wasn't enough uh, to include it at the time, you know, three years ago. Asking me to remember something I did three days yeah. ago. <laughs> but most of them ask. Um, I don't know, like looking at it now, it feels like there's stuff I would move out of it more now than add. <laughs> Fair enough. I don't know. I've just been like, I've been working on Perl lately. And so it kind of thing, it feels to me like that whole functionals chapter really should just be a Perl vignette. Um, <laughs> but I think that's a pretty natural kind of flow for us. Like things sort of as things develop, like stuff that was in the book originally moves into vignettes and stuff that's in vignettes, we decide it's more generally applicable and kind of flows from place to place over time. That totally makes sense. Is there anything that you um, 
would really like to expand on, if not totally redo um, or add, I mean. So just, well, I guess um, probably probably the tidy eval stuff. Yeah, there's a tidy eval. I think we've learned like quite a lot more about how to actually handle how to use conditions effectively in code now. Um, just in terms of the stuff we're using more in dplyr and, and per and places in terms of like chaining error messages so you get enough context to figure out where problems come from. So for example, the next version of per, when you get in it, when a map function generates an error, it'll automatically tell you which index, which element that error occurred on, which is really, um, really important. And that like, I don't know, it's taken us a surprising a long amount of time to figure out how to do that. And I actually looked, there's a, in Flyer, which is kind of one of the precursors to Per. Um, it's almost, it's, it's, it's like, it was like so close. There's like this um, dot and form argument that you could use, um, which, would, which would kind of do that for you, but it didn't do it for you automatically because it made it too slow. And then it turns out like the reason it was too slow is just because we put the for loop in, inside, we put the try catch inside the for loop instead of putting the for loop inside the try catch. <laughs> so it's kind of like, we're so like, I don't know, like 10 years ago, I was like so close to it. But we just like <laughs> missed it and uh, never came back. <laughs> That's funny. All right, I uh, need to get my other window back up. There we go. Uh, so, um, this one I think relates to, uh, some, some recent changes in, um, tidy select, uh, June is asking, how do you decide that an argument in data wrangling functions should take a column as a string versus a symbol or both? Um, the example he gives is names from versus name names to in pivot wider. Uh, but there are other. Examples. Yeah, so tidy, uh, um, I think generally like the convention we, we've kind of gone with for tidy R is that if you're providing the name of the existing column, it should just use, it should use tidy select. And so that means you like when you're working with it interactively, you just provide the bare column name. But that also does support like quoting the column name as well because um, that's useful for avoiding our command check nodes. Um, and then when you're referring to providing the name of a variable, you're, a column you're going to create, that should always be a string. But we can't really fully realize that vision because that would require like breaking a bunch of existing functions to make them stricter. <laughs> so um, we've opted to not do that. But yeah, the basic principle is like, if it's a new variable, it should be a string. If it's an existing variable, you should be able to refer to it any way that you can refer to a variable with, with tidy select. That makes sense. Um, let's see. Uh, so another another question uh, that I, I think I have seen you speaking about recently, June asks, what is the future of per style anonymous functions in the tidyverse for development, education, et cetera, given the new BASAR uh, anonymous function shorthand? I think we've basically decided that that did to us. Um, <laughs> so they'll, they'll, can, you know, they'll continue, we'll continue working them. You know, they'll continue to work um, where they work today. We won't add support for them in new places and we will, um, not really use them in the documentation where possible. So the next version of, it took us quite a while to figure out how to do this, but in the next version of per, uh, the examples all use the base pipe and the new anonymous function um, syntax. Um, does, does the, um, I mean, you support back before the base pipe still, right? Yeah. So that were so the so the examples will not basically we've decided the, the thing okay. with our best compromise is that <laughs> the package itself itself will continue to work, but the examples 
will not. And so if you read the examples in an older version of I, it just gives you a message saying the examples may use the base type and the new function syntax operator, which will not work in your version of R. And I, I think that I, we decided that's a reasonable compromise because I think in most cases people are not using, like, are not interactively using new versions of tidyverse packages on old versions of R it's because it's running in some you know, development and production environment that's using an old version of R. So hopefully that will not cause um, <laughs> problems. But but we're just doing that as an experiment, a per, and if that experiment goes well, I think we'd roll that out to. The deep wire and the everywhere eventually. Okay. Uh, this one um, might be uh, too big of a question. We'll see. So, this is uh, from Pierre. He asks uh, When programming with the tidyverse, when should you use data masking, uh, the embrace operator, tidy eval, um, indexing with the pronoun, uh, et cetera? So like how did how to decide when to use all the different um, idioms, I guess. Uh -oh. Yeah, so I've just been working on a new <laughs> chapter in Alpha Data Science on this. <laughs> um, because I think it's actually it's actually simple enough now that it, it can be part of Alpha Data Science. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be anything more complicated. Because when you're just writing functions for data analysis. Like when you are looking at your data analysis, extracting out repeated code, all you need to know about is embracing. And that's it. So all you need to be able to know is how to recognize an argument is either data masking or tidy selection, which you can do just by looking at the documentation. And then you just have to embrace if you're using an argument that's going into one of those tidy eval arguments. So that that's like pretty that's pretty simple, um, I think. And so the other cases that are more complicated is like if you start to use it in a package, then you've got to consider how to suppress the um, sort of false positives from R command check. Um, where you've got to learn about like dot data or putting variable names in quotes. Or if you're like iterating over variable, if you're iterating over variable somehow um, using map and not across, uh, where you need to know where you're probably going to have a character vector variable names that you have to index into somehow. Uh, but I think most both of those last two cases are like relatively uh, much less common. And so like embracing should get you like 90% of, of what you need most of the time. Okay. Um, and then the last one that's uh, mostly advanced star uh, related. So what, and I think we asked this the last time we had you uh, in this group, what would you recommend reading after advanced star to become a better programmer? Um, Trevin says that Mastering Shiny and R packages are on his list. Are there any non-R books that you would recommend? Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are like, there's lots of, I think that in other programming languages, there are a much wider selection of books where you can learn to become like a better programmer or a better software engineer. Um, but obviously to benefit from them, you're going to have to learn another language generally, and you're going to have to figure out like what bits of that language apply to R and which don't, which is like a, a lot. Um, <laughs> so in some ways, like, you know, I, I, it's not unreasonable to say like at some point the, the, the next best thing you can do to become a better program in R is to become a better program in another language, because that's going to force you to like learn a bunch of new things, expose yourself to a new community that does things like slightly differently, expose you to um, ideas that maybe you don't see very often in R, either because they're hard to do in R or because maybe they're just not popular. Uh, so I think like that is worthwhile. Um, in R itself, I don't, I don't know, it feels very self-serving to only recommend my own <laughs> books, but 
like I legitimately wrote those books because like nothing else existed at the time that I really liked and to, nothing still really does there's you know there's bits and pieces here and there but uh, and you know like there's lots of stuff you can pick up from from blogs but I don't know of any like big treatments that I particularly like um you know there's certainly like some other you know, I think there's a um The Colin Gillespie, oh. one of the Collins wrote the faster yeah. R. Uh, Colin Gillespie. Yep. Yeah. Efficient R yeah. programming. Yeah. That's a good one. That's pretty good. Um, but yeah, there's just not that that much, unfortunately. Um, I mean, another bit of advice, which is basically useless is to write a book about it because that's a really <laughs> good way of learning stuff that's that's helped me become a better programmer is writing books about it but i don't think that's uh, terribly useful advice in general um i will say on that though it, it's interesting to watch when you're working on a book because i remember there was um something in mastering shiny that was it was it the the whole thing around um, how modules are called? Something fundamentally changed while you were working on the book, and you know you could see comments going back and forth of like refining how it how the code worked, so it was easy, you know because it was hard to describe it, and that's a good sign that maybe something needs to be changed. Um, I just yeah. found that really we did, interesting. What did we, we did sampling the modules, <laughs> which is just like turning them in. So they're like just changing the order or like turning them inside out somehow that I think made a big difference and that's old um amongst them in jail or not. But yeah, I mean <laughs> you know, writing about stuff, you know, it doesn't have to be a book, like blog, you know, writing little blog posts right. is also like super useful, just forcing yourself to get concrete and explain it to someone else or like really exposes like when you don't understand things. I see someone mentioned uh SICP in the chat. Um yeah, that that was one of the books that I I found like really opened my mind to kind of the, the possibilities of things. Like I think that was the book that made me realize like, oh, I could implement my own object owner programming system. <laughs> um, whether that was like a net good thing from the world since I've <laughs> now created like four different object owner programming systems in R. Um, whether that's good or not is a different question. Um, but I think that like that does kind of make you like it, it really helps you think about like the, the, the kind of the, the smallest possible components of a programming language and how you build them up to something big. But it is like it is a pretty dense book. Um, yeah, that's uh, Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, uh, second yeah. edition for anyone who can't see the chat. Um, so, uh, June, June asked a lot of questions. Uh, what is the future of documentation for ggplot2? Specifically, it's hard to know what can go in the dots of layers. What are the challenges of doing this right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's sort of the fundamental challenge of like documenting ggplot2 is because it's like you have all these small pieces and you can combine those pieces in lots of different ways. Um, I, I think there's some like relatively simple stuff we can do to just make it clear, like, um, like where the dot, dot, dot kind of goes, like what the parameters are. And some of that we could probably like automate with code a bit more to at least like list them out. Um, but yeah, the generally, I don't know, some and then some of it's just like unfixable without fundamentally re-architecturing ggplot2, which we have no plans to do in the short term. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Gus asked, uh, with everyone jumping on the Quarto train, uh, what are the plans for our markdown? Will it be moved to a legacy product as Quarto matures? Uh, yeah, I think it'll, it'll basically kind of stay as is, you know, like our markdown, incredibly, incredibly popular tool. Um, it's never going to go away. Um, 
but all of the new staff will like will be in will be in quarto. Um, and you know, so and so much of like uh, you know, our markdown is kind of Pandoc plus Nitar, and Quarto is also Pandoc plus Nitar, you know, plus a bunch of other things. So there's also like quite a lot of overlap between Quarto and our markdown because they, you know, they both use Nitar for the actual evaluation of our code. So it's not like it's a, um, you know, it's not like everything is going away. It's just that that bit that handles the, the Pandoc. Um, side of things is, is shifting to a new token. What what would it take for vignettes to move to Quarto? I mean, basically, Cran has to install Quarto. Um, and that no one has any control over. <laughs> yeah. Um, and not just Cran, but like, and that, you know, saying Cran has to install makes it sound like this one thing, but what I actually <laughs> mean is all four or five people who actively maintain checks on Cran would have to install it on their machines of varying architectures. So I, I don't think it's like, it's not never because uh, Cran, the, you know, the Cran folks tend to be pretty big into reproducible documentation and, and literate programming. Uh, they, you know, they jumped on our markdown and Pandoc pretty quickly. So I, I don't think it's like, it's not never gonna happen, but we're not going to make any um, you know, big plans for until that happens, <laughs> particularly since like the main advantage, there's, there's relatively few, few advantages of it for, for vignettes um, compared to our markdown. Fair enough. Um, so we have a question that I, I don't know that you would have a lot of uh, insight on, but I think there's a related question. So the question is, how would you look for jobs that use R, for example, for data science and analytics, which keywords or specialized job boards do you recommend? And on that same idea of, do you have any tips for just searching for R things? Because, you know, searching for the letter R doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah, I have like literally no idea how to find a job. Because yeah, I, <laughs> I thought that would like I've only had true. two had like two real jobs. One of which was a university job, which is like totally different to an industry job, and one of which was like joining our studio, which is a little different again. Um, <laughs> but I think I don't know. Like searching for R, like Google does, in my experience, seem to be kind of fine just by adding R onto things. If you Google for something with R and nothing relevant to R turns up, it's often because it's like nothing relevant exists. Um, that's most, that's, I don't know, that, I felt like that was a problem like kind of years ago, it was hard to find yeah. stuff, but now it's not something that I spend much time thinking about, which implies I don't, it just works <laughs> when I do it. Fair enough. Um, um, so Arthur asks, uh, do you have any recommendations for where a newbie uh, can find packages that demonstrate an effective and readily intelligible use of S3 or of S4? No. <laughs> um, I, mean, I mean, part of the challenge is like for S3, and S4 to like really be worthwhile, you have to be in a fairly like complex scenario, right? Because if it was, if it was so simple, you didn't need them, there wouldn't be any benefit to it. So there's sort of like hard to find like really simple examples because it doesn't make sense to use S3 or S4. Um, I mean, in my opinion is you'll never find anything simple for S4 because it's just fundamentally not simple. Um, <laughs> S3. It's trying to be most of the places in the sort of hard to find examples in the tidyverse because typically, like I think our most successful kind of generics, like the, the code spread ends up spread out over like multiple packages because that's one of the benefits of S3. You can have different parts of the simple system implemented in different places. Um, and I'm sure there are like, you know, good packages that, that illustrate the use of S3 in relatively simple cases, but I'm just don't, <laughs> not familiar with them. I, um, I, 
I can't think of any uh, either because a lot of the places, you know, like you say, when it's implemented, it's because something complicated is happening. And then you add on top of that, um, you know, things that are like calling C code or something. And so it makes it even more difficult to follow. Um, yeah. And then other yeah. like the simpler kind of packages in the tidyverse tend to be, you know, like they're all around like one type of data, like string after string, super so date times. Um, and there it's not, um, you know, you don't really need generics because everything's the same type. I mean, yeah. the Lubridate has some now stuff that I would consider to be mostly ill advised. Um, where most of the Lubridate functions work on various different types of date time data. So there's some generics there, like, you know, like all of the Lubridate functions are generic because um, they can work with all these different types of date time data. But I, I think now that was mostly a, mis a mistake and it's just made things more complicated for relatively little gain. Fair enough. Uh, we've got an anonymous question here. Um, where do you see R growing as far as sectors and applications? I mean, it's going to keep, I don't know, it's like super popular in pharma. It's going to keep growing there, I would imagine. Seeing a lot of like, you know, insurance and finance using it more and more. I, I kind of hope that like it keeps kind of taking over Mindshare from Excel um you know r isn't a good solution for everything you can do in excel but there's a lot of stuff that people have to do very painfully manually in excel that they would like just have a much better time with in r. um so that's not really like a sector but i think this there's this sort of like people who are doing like quite sophisticated stuff in excel would be much better served by le learning r like it's going to be some initial pain and frustration, but they're just going to end up with like, um, you know, things that are so much more reproducible and so much easier to work with. You can just think of the, you know, people, there's still, you know, thousands of people who are kind of like collating, hundreds of thousands of people collating, like, oh, I've got 12 monthly spreadsheets, I need to create a yearly spreadsheet and they're copying and pasting, um, you know, them all together and no one enjoys doing that and everyone knows it's error pro and they're just looking for a, a better solution all right um so federica asked uh with all these you know all the books you're working on and all the packages that you work on how do you decide what's next yeah i don't know that's a tough tough question um i mean at the moment like pretty much everything i'm working on is being driven by the second edition of alpha data science so like writing out you know just like re-looking at stuff and like, trying to explain things it's just like forced me to like reconsider like so many little things here and there and that's kind of accumulated up into the bigger changes um Otherwise, it's just sort of, I don't know, somehow sort of like, you know, I talk to a bunch of people, I'm on Twitter, and that somehow like feeds into my brain. I'm like, well, this is kind of feels like this is getting more and more important, and we're not putting any time into it. And maybe now is, is the time. Um, you know, another thing lately that we've just been investing a lot in general is like error messages and input validation and making sure you get useful messages. It's not like, particularly like sexy or exciting, but just like <laughs> grinding down these like edge cases so that if people do something like really weird, instead of getting like an utterly uninformative error, like three steps later, you get a nice error message that clearly says what you, you know, that the input type is not expected and you get the name of the function where it occurs, ideally the argument, and you can easily get a, a, a trace back that takes you from exactly your code to where that happened. So it's not just about like like doing these like big things. I think there's also a huge amount of value in just like the slow kind of grinding down this sort of like one percent improvement repeated <laughs> again and again and again and again. Um, Those things that'll save only a few seconds, but it'll save like 
thousands of people a few seconds every several times a day. Hopefully, Hopefully yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then so. I, I mean, and then generally, I just I tend to kind of flip between like focusing on one or two like really big things versus like pushing out lots of smaller releases with minor changes, just because after a while of like working on one or two like big things, I start to get kind of like tired of that, or, like tired of all the design the iteration. And and I just want to like knock out a bunch of like simple things. So I'll flip to that. And then after a while of that, I get like sick of just doing all of these like little incremental things and having to juggle like six package releases on my head at the same time. I'm like, okay, I want to go back to just focusing on one big thing for a few weeks. Uh, well, the speaking of the little things, uh, Gus asked for uh, those of us that would like to start contributing, um, how can we identify good first issues? Yeah, that's a tough one. So you kind of go through like, I don't know, all, like it, it's hard to contribute um, like a new code. It's for sort of obvious reasons. It's hard to contribute like documentation because often, um, you know, you can't write good documentation until you like understand something really well. And the reason that you want to contribute to the documentation is because the thing is poorly explained. And it's like hard to write tests because like figuring out like the right kind of quantity and like positive predictive value versus negative predictive value is, is tough. So I think we like we kind of go through like and have like eliminated every obvious like starting place. Um, I think it's a matter of like finding like something like small, whether it's in like code or test or documentation, working your way out. Like start by like getting getting to grips with like the whole kind of get our pull request process by fixing some like typos. Like there's tons of typos in the documentation. Um, like just find them and fix them. And you know, it's not a gigantic improvement, but you know, you get that experience of doing the whole, you know, forking on GitHub, getting on your computer, making a branch, pushing it to GitHub, doing the review, that kind of stuff is um is is really useful. That's funny. So he says in the chat that he actually just found a broken link to fix. So he's gonna get started on uh his on contributing right now. Perfect. Great. Yeah, and then like <laughs> once you've got that kind of under your belt, then you can start to look for, you know, another thing that's really useful is not necessarily like fixing code, but like read the issues that aren't tagged and like help them make a better reprex. Like so many of the issues, like the first thing I have to do is turn whatever code they've provided, which is sometimes like nightmarishly formatted, it's not in markdown code block and just like, like get that into a correctly formatted out markdown code block. Um, and then like basically style is kind of like the first step. Um, and you know, like anyone can do that. That is not something that I am like uniquely qualified to do. Um, and then like, like see if you can make the reprex any simpler. Cause that's the next thing I will do. And that, you know, that is tough. Like often, like if you're more familiar with the actual implementation, like, you know, I'll come into that with some idea of like what the problem is and might be able to narrow it down. Um, but you can still just like grind away at it. Um, I, I had a recent experience doing this cause I have this problem in R Studio with a visual, where I'm using the visual editor and I send a code block to the console and it's like off by one line. And <laughs> no one else could like reproduce this or like, and then we finally figured out like specific, some specific documents that had this problem. And then after like, I don't know, multiple attempts, I discovered to trigger the problem, you have to have a code block. And then somewhere below that code block, you have to have a bulleted list with at least two elements, each containing another code block. <laughs> and then if you have that, and then you delete a line somewhere higher up in the document, then that triggers a button. And like that, you know, 
I had some little hints of like where that problem might have been coming from, from because one of the developers chimed in about talked about one of the problems that like gave me the idea of like this list. But that was just like a lot of like trial and error and starting with like <laughs> here is a chapter where this fails and like now I'm gonna delete this half. Oh, it's gone, it's still there, so I'll try deleting that half. Oh, it's gone, so it must be in this half. And just like iteratively like grinding away, like deleting, you know, one thing at a time until nothing remains. It's like that that's really can be really really useful to do that in issues as well and then you know sometimes that just like that that reveals the problem and then you know, work around and that's super useful that's that's a really good tip um going through the issues and trying to make the existing issues better rather than uh either trying to fix them or trying to add more issues well and, and then if you're going to go fix them like yeah that's the first thing you have to do anyway right. so it's <laughs> useful yep. useful first step no matter what that's great uh so corey asked does clock use the same uh s4 as lubridate or is that a spot where they diverge yeah so clock um does not use s4 uh and i think it avoids kind of the reason that we had to use it in lubridate was to like make plus and minus work and I think we kind of like dodged the issue. Davis dodged the issue in clock by not like providing add and subtract mm -hmm. methods, but providing like more specific stuff, which turns out to like, I mean, at, at some point we're going to have to like to resolve this tension between Lubridate and clock. And I think the way we're going to do that is that Lubridate will just use clock with some like defaults set so that you get like reasonably like good behavior um like one of the things that's like both good and bad about clock is that if there's any chance of ambiguity arising it forces you to confront confront it like up front um even if it's only potential and not actual in your data so that requires you like learn a bunch more about date time than you probably want to it's probably good for you but probably not necessarily what you want to be doing to solve a data analysis challenge um, and so like, and, and that turns out like, you know, the, one of the drawbacks of like plus is there's no way to supply like additional arguments to deal with all of these like various ambiguities. So I think, you know, what will probably happen is like Lubridate will keep using plus behind the scenes that will call some clock functions with the right default arguments here. And if you don't like them, then you can call the clock functions yourself. So we have kind of like a string R stringy you know, situation going on makes sense uh so we have a an anonymous question what is your typical approach to debugging pipes and do you have a suggestion of where to learn uh pipe debugging i mean we you know i just don't really use that many <laughs> pipes um because i don't do that much data analysis um but you know, like generally i have a problem with a pipe like just break the pipe up and like check it a step at a time to make sure it's doing what I expect. Um, and I think that's the, I don't know, it's the only way to do it sometimes. If it's really long, that may be a sign you've made a, it's too long and you should have broken up earlier. Um, otherwise, you know, there's this general strategy of like dividing something in half. Like, is this half okay? <laughs> is this half okay? And then, you know, then you can kind of narrow quickly narrow down by like splitting the problem in half each time to, to figure out what the, the root source of the problem is. Um, that, that makes sense. Um, ha, Arthur asks, has Posit considered updating the data browser in our studio? For wide data, it can be hard to inspect a given line. For example, no line highlighting uh, paging of columns. Yeah, I think that's something that's kind of on the very long to do list to re examine <laughs> at some point. Um, so, no plans in the immediate future, but you know, we definitely know that there are weaknesses and places we could do better. It's just a matter of kind of accumulating enough of those small data browser things that's worth like someone, you know, spending a couple of weeks on it, loading it all up in the head, how it works, and figuring out how to make it better. But some point in the future. <laughs> Okay. Uh, oh, Arthur also asks, what future do you see for Haven? Any plans to expand functionality? For example, show value labels in data browser, provide helper functions like labeled? 
Mm, not really. I think it's <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I think Haven's like basically done from my <laughs> perspective. Um, you know, we'll keep kind of maintaining it, keep updating it as a uh, breed stat underlying package changes, but I don't just not like, I don't just care enough about that as a problem <laughs> to spend much more time on it. So I think it's great that the labeled package exists and, uh, you know, folks are using it and building on top of Haven. That makes sense. Um, Ethan says that the description of maintaining and fixing software sounds like it can be a lot of manual work. Is that ever frustrating when the end product often automates things? Mm. I don't know. I think it's just something you have to like <laughs> live with. You either like come to accept that or you leave software development in the field. So I don't know. I'm like mostly okay with that now. Um, you know, over time we've like we automate more and more. Like you know, I think we use like use this as a really good example of a package where we've like spent some time to automate stuff. Um and we generally do it um kind of too late. Like typically when we automate something and use this, we're like, oh wow, we should have automated that ages ago. Um but I, I also think that that's kind of like the right approach because if you automate things too early, you spend all this time like automating things. And it would have been taking you less time to just do it by hand. So, and that's like an easy trap for the programmers to fall into. Uh, so Trevin asks, when looking at a new to you package, especially a bigger package, how do you go about learning how it works and understanding the code? Yeah, so I've been doing like quite a lot of this lately because now, um, our policy is like when we make a breaking change, like deliberately make a breaking change to a package, we will do pull requests to any package that we break on CRAN. Mm -hmm. And we do this, I think, partly to like, like build our own empathy with package developers, <laughs> partly to you know help them out and partly just expose ourselves to what like packages look like. So my experience is like, I'm getting better and better, like, parachuting into a package that I've never used before. I've got no idea what it does, but I know this one test now fails that didn't fail and I have to fix it. Um, so I guess my experience is more like I'm getting better at like not understanding a package so I can just fix it. Uh, and I just like try and stay like razor focused on like, and I'm not like, oh my God, this is awful. Like, why would anyone do this? This code is formatted in the craziest way I've ever seen. Like. Uh, I, I don't know, I have to like, just stay like focused on like, what is the one specific thing I, I want to fix. Um, otherwise, like when I'm like, really like when there's a package I really want to understand, um, I find the best way for me to do that is to kind of like, like rewrite it and tweak it and like, you know, change, do things the way that I would do them because that kind of forces me to like carefully work through like, what is this code doing? Why is it doing it this way? Um, and then sometimes, you know, most of the time that just, I just leave that on my computer. And sometimes if I feel like it's a particularly useful contribution, I'll do a pull request back to the, the maintainer, but, uh, mostly it's just like, it, that's just the way I understand things is by like <laughs> implementing it myself and changing things and seeing what breaks. So, uh, I, I have done that same kind of thing and I'm wondering with you as a you know very exper experienced package developer, how often do you find, oh, that's why they did it that way um, after you've rewritten it and you, you know, mm -hmm. something breaks? <laughs> oh, sometimes a lot of that's <laughs> like, a lot of I'm like, oh, that's why they did it this way because this thing didn't work because that thing didn't work and this thing didn't work. <laughs> you know, they just changed this one thing up here. Uh, like all of this code just goes away and it's not needed. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, yeah, right. a lot of it, yeah, I think the, the, the biggest struggle I have is like when I read code, I like expect to have a fairly clear mental model of like what are the types of all the things, like is this a vector, is this a matrix, is this a data frame? And then like I, like I think, and when I read code, I can't build that up because it's too like wibbly, like you can kind of feed it <laughs> anything and it like does something. 
it's just hard, like it's hard for me to reason about it. It's easy to sort of build this like tower of hacks. You've gone this like very unstable foundation that people kind of like, you know, sometimes you can like stabilize it all up and it all kind of comes okay. And sometimes it just gets like worse and worse and more hacks and tops of hacks and tops of hacks. Yeah. Particularly like, I see this a lot with like tidy evaluation where it's very clear, like people, like someone is like, kind of iterated their way to a solution. And I'm like, okay, well, here's this like, here's 30 lines of like bang, bang, and then quo and curly, curly. And I'm just gonna delete all of it and replace it with like four characters because you're just doing and undoing things like right. repeatedly. And you know, like I understand people get to the state because they just try things out and get things working and change them a little bit, but I can like, because I understand what, like <laughs> how it all works. I'm like, okay, just, just do this. It's way simpler. And it turns out that they just need to pass the dots or something along yeah, those lines. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So Trevin uh, asked, and this is probably going to close it up, uh, stealing this question from Chris Albin. What have you bought in the last few years that has made you a better programmer or has made programming more enjoyable? Mm, what have I bought? Or I guess otherwise acquired. <laughs> I think... I mean, one thing I did relatively recently is I just decided like, I, I don't know, like it was time to kind of refresh my my office. So I got um, like a nice stand for my monitor and my um, my laptop. So they all just kind of like float off the desk. There's like more clear desk space and they're like all at the right height and it's easy for me to like move them up and down. Um, and that was, you know, a few hundred dollars worth of <laughs> bits and pieces, but it's just, it, I don't know like how much of it is an improvement and how much of it's just like a change and that is all you need sometimes. Um, I also had my, uh, my, this office, my office chair, like professionally cleaned for the first time in like <laughs> eight, I don't know, eight years. <laughs> you know, I spent like eight hours a day sitting in this thing. I was like, oh, it's kind of looking a little grimy. Maybe I should have cleaned. And that was quite nice too. All right. Well, I think that is going to take us right to the time. So thank you very much. Um, this video will be up on YouTube uh, shortly. And uh, we just, we thank you a ton for, for joining us today. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.